Today I'm here to talk about consciousness. To talk about a hypothesis about consciousness. And uh, the hypothesis that may sound a little bit uh, strange at first, a little bit uh, uh, different from what you're used to think uh, of when you deal with the topic of consciousness. As all of you well know, probably uh, consciousness is one of the most difficult problems today in neuroscience. In fact, it is called the hard problem because nobody has a clue as to how neural activity becomes our familiar phenomenal experience. So, Einstein famously said that, that when the problem repeatedly, constantly, um, doesn't want to be explained, uh, what we need to do is to get back to the premises. Maybe the problem seems to be not solvable, seems to be impossible to be explained because we are starting from the wrong assumption. That's why the problem is so difficult. Not because the nature is uh, mischievous, not because uh, nature doesn't want to be explained, but because we made a mistake from the start. So, today you will see why I call this uh, hypothesis. That I would like to discuss it with you because uh, as uh, Emiliano said, uh, uh, it's true that today I teach, uh, I'm, a, I'm a professor of philosophy, but I began as an engineer, as a bioengineer. So I'm a strong physicalist. And I believe that everything must be explained in uh, physicalistic uh, uh, terms. That everything must be explained just in uh, uh, terms of physical stuff. There's nothing else, in my opinion. As an engineer, I'm probably even more physicalist than, than neuroscientist. So, for those of you who are familiar with the theories about consciousness, you may remember that uh, there were identity theories in the past. They were called mind-brain identity theories. And they were those theories, for example, Armstrong or uh, uh, Smart or many neuroscientists, who suggested that, after all, uh, our consciousness must be nothing but uh, neural activity. So there must be some neural activity which is our consciousness. And more or less, everybody has been following this idea. But today we will see that this idea may be, uh, how could I say, may be presented, may, may, may take uh, an unexpected uh, turn. Might, might be used in a totally different way. So, let's see if I can use this. Uh, so, most of the people in the past have been looking for consciousness inside the brain. In one way or another, from Kazaniga to Koch to Chalmers to Seth to Tononi, they've been looking for consciousness inside the brain. And uh, they have something in common with uh, past philosophers and scientists, and Plato and Descartes and Galileo, even if everybody says, oh no, we're not like Descartes. Descartes is the bad guy, Descartes is a dualist, we're not dualist. But people keep looking inside the brain for something that is different from the brain. Consciousness, I think we can uh, safely agree, that is totally different from everything that so far has been found inside the brain. Inside the brain we have found uh, neural activity, glia, blood, uh, chemical substances, uh, electric activities. Have we ever found anything like our conscious experience inside the brain? Have you ever seen an fMRI where there is, a, uh, let's say, the experience of red? The experience? No. What you've seen so far, I think we can agree about that, you've seen correlation. You see neural activity which is correlated with someone claiming, reporting, having a conscious experience. But could you tell by looking at brain whether there is anything that is conscious inside the, the brain? Could you? Is the very notion of a conscious brain uh, uh, physically acceptable? Is consciousness a physical property? I can distinguish between a brain which is alive and a brain which is not alive, a brain which is doing, which is having chemical activity in the brain that doesn't do certain kind of chemical processes. But can I tell anything here in the brain which is like a consciousness? I think that so far that's not possible. And that's why all of these people have something in common. They need to um, add something to the physical world. 
they need to add something to the physical world. From Plato with the ideas to the cards, with the thinking substance to to, to uh, Galileo. Galileo in 1623 in the Essayer wrote famously that uh, the, the, our sensations are inside the living being, the animal, the body. But about what they are inside, I don't know anything. So I, I will just stop here. And all of these people, one way or another, they are adding something to the physical picture. Integrated information, uh, spatial properties, a panpsychist, even a panpsychist, or some other strange kind of, uh, of uh, new properties. Stuff that is not 100% physical and stuff that, um, a little bit suspiciously, takes place only in the brain, or mostly only in the brain, which suggests to me that they may be after some ad hoc explanation, something that they feel they need to add just because they need to add something to the physical uh, description of... Uh, okay, Carlo, if, you, if you just can label the name, uh, I don't know if of the series. Ah, okay. Plato, René Descartes, uh, Galileo Galilei, uh, Giulio Tononi, Integrated Information Guy, uh, Christoph Koch, who has been working with uh, Francis Crick and has been always at the center of uh, uh, consciousness studies, David Chalmers, a very famous uh, uh, philosopher who famously coined the word, uh, the heart problem. Uh, and so this is uh, from uh, uh, Christoph Koch's book, uh, 2004, The Cast for Consciousness, and uh, that's more or less the way in which in neuroscientists we deal with consciousness. We have the external world, where there is a dog. Then we have uh, the body, neural activity, which may be studied in greater and greater detail. And then, somehow, magically, at the end of the chain, neural activity becomes something totally different from everything we had so far. It becomes what? It becomes a conscious experience, which is very suspiciously very much alike the dog in the external world. And it's very strange, physical. If I look at this chain, which has been uh, uh, one of the diagrams, the central diagram in Christoph Koch's uh, approach, it is uh, very suspicious that the only two things that are alike are the external object and one's conscious experience. Everything in between is totally different. And uh, this is uh, a model of uh, consciousness that has been uh, uh, described by many authors, like uh, many, many philosophers, as the digestive process of consciousness. As though the brain uh, was able to produce a secret juice, which is our conscious experience, and by uh, acquiring information from the external world, the brain is somehow able to produce the conscious experience. But if you look inside the brain, we don't find anything like our conscious experience. I repeat, we find plenty of correlation, all kinds of correlations. And today we are so good in finding correlation that we are even able to reconstruct what one is looking at by uh, recording the activity in the occipital area, in the visual areas. We are able to reconstruct what one is looking at. However, we have no explanation as to why a brain should have any experience of the external world. The brain may work happily, may do all the correlations, may do all the functional uh, uh, recognition, all the um, cognitive processing, without, without having any, any uh, experience at all. So we don't know why the brain should produce this special juice. So I mentioned at the, at the onset that a very reasonable hypothesis at first in the 50s, 
was that there had to be some neural activity inside the brain that had to be our conscious experience. That's what neuroscientists have been looking for in the last 70 years. They, were looking, they have been looking for some neural activity which may be one with our experience. After all, our experience is a physical fact. I have a physical experience right now of you. So there must be something inside my brain which is my experience. That has to be there, must be there physically. What is the problem of this approach? The problem of this approach is that, as I am repeating, that's just my introduction, classical introduction, is that so far, if there is one result from neurosciences that has been consistent so far, was that nothing in the brain is like our conscious experience. So one may start to wonder, well, maybe the wrong assumption, we are looking in the wrong place. As strange as it might sound at first, it might be that consciousness is not in the brain. Why not? Because we haven't found it in the brain. And we are looking for consciousness more and more with greater and greater detail. The Tesla, the fMRI machine, I remember when we met the first time, we, we, we had a Tesla machine of one, one Tesla, two Tesla, something like that. Exactly. Now we have a Tesla machine of seven. seven. So we are able to see, we are able to make intra recording with greater and greater detail. But everything we find is not like our experience. Why people keep looking inside? I understand why. Let, let, let me put it in, in my, um, well, in the classic neuroscientist shoes. Why people keep looking for consciousness inside the brain? Because people believe that they are, like me, that the consciousness is a physical phenomenon. If it is a physical phenomenon, they say, it must be inside the body. And where in the body? It must be inside the brain. However, however, this might be not necessary. So we don't need to look for consciousness necessarily inside the body, if you are a physicalist. We can look for consciousness inside the physical world. How could, how could we do that? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Well, that, that's what Massimini and Tononi, of course, claim. Because they claim that our conscious experience is a phenomenon inside the head. But what proof do they have that this phenomenon that we call consciousness is inside the brain? They know that if we switch off the brain, we are no longer conscious. But does that show that consciousness has to be inside the brain? No. For example, let's suppose that we had a radio. And we don't know anything about how a radio works. But we could find out that if we destroy the radio, if we switch off the radio, then we are no longer able to hear the music. But are the singers and the music and, and, and the composer and the speakers inside the radio? No. Because what we know from neuroscience is that the brain is necessary to have a conscious experience. Does it follow from that that consciousness is inside the brain? No, it doesn't. In order to show that, we should prove, we should provide evidence that the phenomenon that we call consciousness is physically located. We should find it, basically. Otherwise, the burden of the proof is on the shoulder of people who keep claiming that consciousness is inside a physical object, the brain, that doesn't have any of the property that we find in conscious experience. So we cannot start from the, and I will provide more about that, of course, this is central to mine, but uh, we have no evidence that we are locked in in the brain, that we are, uh, have, that everything that we see is a movie projected inside the brain. In order to claim that, we should be able first to find the movie inside the brain, somehow, but not assuming that it has to be in the brain and therefore it, we are uh, just inside the brain. Because that, logically speaking, uh, philosophically speaking, is a bad in the question. Is it just uh, doing a circular argument? I start from an assumption and I take that assumption to be true. So let, let, me, let me proceed further with this. Uh, 
So anyway, today all of the people keep looking back at the moon in Coke, this is just from 2022, in March, keep looking from science, they keep looking for conscience inside neurology. I think that we need something totally different. So, as I said, right now, I, I use the apple, my favorite example, my favorite object. You stare at this apple, and all of you, of course, uh, have a brain. And you have an experience of this apple. This experience, your experience right now, if, you, if I ask you, what is your experience made of? What do you find in your experience when you watch, when you look at an apple? And I would assume that, more or less, if you're not blind, you would find red, redness, roundness, shininess, something like that. Now, the neuroscientist says, I need to find out an explanation, I need to find a conscious experience inside the brain. So they look for some neural activity here, which is responsible for such properties. Redness, roundness, shininess. Do neuroscientists find anything like those properties inside the brain? They don't find anything like that. Anything remotely like that. But, and, but they keep looking. They keep looking. They say, give us more money, basically. We will find it. It's only a matter of having uh, bigger machines. It's only a matter of looking deeper inside between neurons. But let me ask you right now, as a physicalist, right now, here, in this room, in front of uh, this subject, let's put the head to, in front of this subject, this is our favorite uh, conscious subject, is there anything physically with the properties of one's conscious experience of looking at the red apple in the close proximity of this head? The apple. The apple is just like our experience of the apple. It is physical. It is round. It is red. It is shiny. So, why should I uh, not take into consideration the apparently preposterous hypothesis that my conscious experience of the apple, rather than being one, with the activity inside the, the brain, might be just one with the external object itself. The external object, it is just like my experience of it. It is much better than anything I will ever be able to find in the brain. If uh, a neuroscientist tomorrow were able to show that whenever I see a red apple, Inside the brain, there is an area that, uh, for some strange phenomenon, becomes uh, slightly roundish, slightly reddish, slightly shiny. That guy would immediately go to Stockholm to ask the Nobel Prize for having found the uh, correlate of the conscious experience of an external object. But there's no hope of finding anything like that inside the brain. So the point is, why do we have to reject the possibility that whenever we have an experience of the world, rather than being one with this piece of the physical world, which is the brain, we are one with this piece of the physical world, which is the object. The idea is that rather than having a mind-brain identity hypothesis, we take into consideration the possibility of having a mind-object identity hypothesis. If I ask you, what do you find right now in your own experience? Do you find neurons? Do you find neural activity? No. You would reply to me that what you find is probably my face, my body, this projector, this image, this screen, which are all stuff that is outside your body. Why could you not be made of physical stuff that is around your body, surrounding your body, rather than me, rather than being made of physical stuff which is inside your body. I know this is a radical hypothesis because we all believe that we must be inside our bodies. 
I know, this is a very strong hypothesis. But this, the fact is that inside our body, we haven't found ourselves. We have found the machines that is responsible, the biological machine that is responsible for the world that we are familiar with to take place in a certain way. And uh, so the mind object identity hypothesis is very simple that the experience of an object is the object itself rather than the brain. Just to make it clear, neuroscientists look for our consciousness here. And activists and other people look at the, our experience in the dynamics between the body and the external object. And why do we not make a step forward? And we take into consideration the possibility that we are one with the external object. It is here, it is physical. From a physicalistic point of view, this is as physical as the brain. This is not idealism. This is not dualism. And uh, let me put another point that I found very convincing. When we say that uh, in our experience there is not the real apple, why do we say that? Have you ever seen a mental apple next to... No. Yes, have you ever seen a mental apple next to a, a physical apple? to say that the apple that you have in your experience is not a physical one? How can you rule out that your experience is not one with the physical world? Why should you claim that your experience is mental? The very notion that our experience is mental, phenomenal, is in a, a philosophical assumption. It is a philosophical assumption because I have no way to put a mental apple next to an apple and to say, okay, this is the mental apple I see in my dream, this is the real apple that is in the world. The fact is that there has always been just one apple. So, I insist very much on this uh, drawing, that maybe the, con con the problem of consciousness is a hard problem, because we keep looking for consciousness in the wrong place. This is not to say that, as I, I will make it clearer in the following, that the brain has no role in, uh, how could I say, in bringing the apple in interaction with the body. As I will show later, the brain is fundamental. But the point is that we have no reason to uh, reject the possibility that the apple, the external object, namely, is uh, the actual thing in the world. There are, okay, you may say, okay, Ricardo, this is a crazy idea, this is already a crazy idea. We, we, we never heard any crazier than that. But there are at least two objections that will immediately lead to your own downfall, that will immediately destroy your hypothesis. And uh, these, two theor two, these two objections actually are the objections that have uh, led many uh, scientists and philosophers to make a distinction between the world of your experience, the phenomenal world, as in Kant, and the physical world, or the nomenic world. What are, those, the, what are uh, these two objections? The first is uh, subjective variability. You will immediately tell me, okay, but here in this room we are uh, 20 people and each of us sees a different apple. Second objection is dreams, hallucination, argument from illusion, where we see an apple and apparently there's no apple. How can my hypothesis survive? So you may say, okay, Ricardo, maybe, but only maybe, your theory works if we have only standard perception. So if every time we see an apple, there is an apple in front of you. But how can you explain that we see different apples? How can we explain that I can see an apple when there's no apple? And I dream, and in my room there's no apple. Well, let me answer to both questions very quickly, in three steps, but I will be uh, much uh, First step, the problem of subjective experience. So, how is that? We all have an experience of a different level. Well, let's start with a simple fact. 
Right now, this apple is still or is it moving? Depending on the frame of reference. So, this apple right now is actually moving in all possible directions. Because right now it is moving at 30,000 km per hour relative to the moon, it is moving at 50 km per hour relative to the car passing by here, it is still relative to us, it is moving relative to the molecules of air right now here in the room uh, at uh, another speed and so forth. So right now this apple, and there's no uh, privileged uh, frame of reference. They're all as important as real. So right now this apple, as strange as it seems, is, is moving in all possible directions. So this property, this fundamental physical property, speed, velocity, is relative. There is no such a thing as true velocity. The, the question, what is the true velocity of this apple, is meaningless. This apple has infinite velocities in all possible directions. My point is that this apple so can exist. This is just about velocity, you all know. The idea is that velocity can be different for each of us. If you were moving, walking in this room, this apple would have a different velocity for each of your bodies. Each of them would bring into existence a different speed. Okay, and what about the other properties that you take for granted? Let's take uh, the screen of a phone. Let's suppose that I put a white image, like that. Is it a white image, just a boring white background? Is the screen white? Well, if you get very close to the screen, let's see if I can do it here, so we're getting closer and closer to the screen, there will be a point where we will be able to see the LCD, the red, green and blue LCD of the screen. At a certain distance from the screen, the screen is no longer white. It is a grid of red, green and blue lights. Is it white or is it a grid of colored points? It is white relative to a human eye at uh, more than uh, 30 centimeters. It is a grid of colored lights for a microscope or for someone much closer. Is it both? Is it both at the same time? And uh, what about other properties? Facciamo un esperimento insieme. Io vado sulla spiaggia e ho un tramonto, una linea del sole. Poi mi muovo e quindi vado in un'altra posizione e come vedete la linea del sole si sposta con me. E infine, tanto per fare l'esempio, mi sposto in una terza posizione e voi vedete che la linea del sole è sempre dove io mi trovo. Questo perché il tramonto è un oggetto relativo ed esiste relativamente al mio corpo. In realtà il tramonto esiste relativamente... Take for example a rainbow, so this is a rainbow, and this is a rainbow seen from a moving observer, from a um, plane flying, you can see here the rainbow, and of course the rainbow is moving together with the plane. So the external object is relative, but it's not relative to a subject, it's relative to another object. So there's nothing mental here. Well, there is perception. Well, the position of the rainbow doesn't require perception. There is no one to perceive it, also you started off saying if you are not blind you can observe the properties, right? So if you don't have a receptor that is capable of taking that property, you are not interested in the properties. A receptor, a receptor is not yet conscious. A receptor is a physical structure that allows to a complex physical phenomenon in the world, as the rainbow or the light sunset or the grid or whatever, to be able to produce an effect. So, for example, in all, so I haven't yet required anything to be conscious. <laughs> so it was an objection. <laughs> he was worried about that. <laughs> so, let me make another example that I like very much. I even brought it with me here. This is a, a, 
an object by Kokichi Sushihara. You see, this is a mirror, the same object, from one perspective looks round, from another perspective looks um, square. It is the same object, you, you can do it afterward if you, if you want. It's very funny, this, just this object here. And you can also do without the, the mirror actually, just the same object seen from different perspective looks like having a different shape. So the same object is uh, relative to different uh, frame of reference, having a different shape. It is able to produce effects as though it had a different shape. So this idea to reply to, to, to your question, you ask you whether we need perception or not. I would say no, we don't. We only need that something is able to produce an effect. When do we have a key, for example? When we have a lock? When do we have a rainbow? When we have a physical structure that is able to allow to that uh, round-shaped structure in the sky to produce an effect? This is an idea that has been around ever since Plato in the sophist. When the stranger, someone Plato didn't like very much, claimed against Plato's view that existence is one with the ideas outside of the causal flow of reality, claimed that to exist means to be able to produce effects. So he basically said that when does something exist? When it is relative to something else. When it is able to produce an effect. So it's a little bit like the, the um, uh, fridge light. Whenever we open the fridge light, we give to the fridge light a possibility to produce effect, to exist. It, we switch it off. We switch it on. And likewise, because we are in a certain place, we allow certain features of the environment to produce effects. Those features are those properties that we find in our experience. Everything we are conscious of is able to produce effects because of us. So the idea is that the object is not an absolute nomenic object, but it is rather a relative object. So we have as many apples right now here as we have bodies, just like we have as many velocities as frame of reference. The notion of relative velocity didn't lead to the, the collapse of physics. It's not that after the, invent the discovery of uh, relative velocity, uh, uh, physicists started to say, OK, physics uh, is no longer a, a science. They said, physics is still a science, only we don't have absolute velocity. Velocity is relative. Likewise, for, because there are different bodies interacting with the same apple, we have different apples. Maybe you're diaphragm, maybe you're blind, maybe you're like a, a bat and you can just uh, echolocate uh, the apple using uh, Wave pressure. So the idea, the reply to the first question is that what has been called the subjectivity, which basically means to be relative to a subject or mind dependent. So you see, here we have the problem that we have uh, to explain subjectivity, we need to refer to terms that are mentalistic in nature, that are outside of the physical world, the subject or the mind. The idea is that we can just reduce subjectivity to being relative to an object. Now, being relative to an object is not um, outside of physics. It is just something that we see it happens in the physical world. So this is the reply to the first problem, the first objection. Basically, this is the reply to the first objection. The first objection is, if our experience is one with the apple, why do we have different experiences? And the reply is that there are different apples. Why? Because whatever is there here in my hand is taking place differently relative to each of you. Why? Because you have a different body. By having a different body, this object has, has different velocities. It also has different uh, colors, different uh, shape, different whatever. Because it takes place relative to your body. Uh, a second objection. 
Okay, so just, just and, and, and a point on which I've been thinking a lot to resist it, to give a relation any kind of uh, ontological status. So this more or less may answer to the problem of subjectivity, to the fact that our experience is different. We, we may argue about that, we can make counterexamples, we can find specific cases that does not seem to fit with this framework. But I'm quite confident that the theory is sound enough to reply to this question. But you may say, okay, okay, maybe you find a way to reply to the objection about the subject relativity. But what about dreams, hallucinations? Come on, illusion. Those are a, a clear example that the brain can have an experience that does not that do not correspond with the external world. How can we survive to such an elementary case? Well, first of all, I would like you to start from the fact that we have no evidence that the brain by itself is able to create anything. Why do I say that? Here we have an expert of dreams, so I hope <laughs> I won't be uh, criticized too much. But as far as we know, the stuff our experience is made of, even when we have hallucination, dreams, uh, illusion, and, and so forth, is something we have met in our uh, perceptual life. So, as far as we know, as far as we know, congenital and total uh, blind subjects are not able to concoct a mental image of color. They're not able, they don't dream about colors. And uh, there are just a few papers that have addressed the possibility that we may have some uh, pristine experience of something we haven't met in our life. But they are very scarce, they are very rare, and they are not really convincing. For example, the, the famous, I will just address one of them because I, I, I could spend an hour just uh, going through all of this literature, but for example, the idea that we are able to see forbidden colors by Bilok and by Crane and Giordani, the Martian color and the like, is not about someone having an experience of a color between red and green that does not exist. It's rather about constructing, constructing a contraption that allows our eyes to work in a way that is able to put together, to perceive basically the world, the external world, in a different way. And if we go through all of the literature, of direct brain stimulation, we will find out that what people experience, hallucinate, and dreams is made of the stuff they met in their life. From painful, I mean, what, what did they see when they were, their brain was stimulated? They see the school, their mother, their relatives, the, the dining room, the front room, and so forth. Or if you take a Charles Bonnet syndrome, once again, people report to see things that were related to their physical work. And even the card. Yeah, please. I'm sorry, but uh, as far as I know from uh, his book, uh, as the part Morgana said, the last day, his dad taught him uh, how to associate colors. Uh, it's not like he was born with color imagery. It's one of the examples that was cited about the perfect The doctor's painter. Yeah. Well, I. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the Turkish painter is quite famous, he's born without eyes. He made a living out of uh, claiming that he's able to know the color of the... And actually there have been a, a couple of circumstances in which they gave him... He's also, he also claims that he's able to see the color that he puts on the, on, on the canvas. And a couple of times some, some, someone uh, uh, gave him just the black uh, inks. And he did that, everything was just black. And then he said, oh yes, I feel the colors, I feel the... So, I don't find the example of the Turkish painting very convincing. That's well, what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. I'm saying yeah. exactly the, the same, but it seems like... Because it was written color imagery in... Uh, right. Dying, yeah. Uh, Are you familiar with Jabberwocky? I think that for a congenitally blind subject, speaking of colors is a little bit like for us, uh, speaking about the, the properties that we find in the poem Jabberwocky. So we can construct some kind of uh, abstract relational structure among uh, uh, mysterious uh, properties, but that's totally different from having an actual experience 
of those properties. Yeah, what I was saying is that, is that I agree on the fact that, for example, color imagery is a strong objection to this because in his case, that he was the first one, he needs biography initially, when right. he's not famous, to say that the, associ the association was actually fictitious, like right. uh, he made it out of scratch from the dead. Because he also said, for example, I never knew what a, 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 like a dark uh, information was like. So he also, for example, he made the example of the apple. Right. He said, like, I don't know what the shadow of an apple is. So I don't know the difference between colors. But at the same time, there were like other properties that, for example, he felt. Uh, Right. That, uh, for yes, example, yes. So he needs to rely on uh, the community of uh, the, the, the people, the site, the, the site, basically. Yeah, I was just to say that. Uh, yes. For example, there are other properties that he was able to receive, it, even if it was conventional design. Exactly. Such as facial properties. That, uh, yeah, and he also, of course, has some uh, verbal and linguistic uh, association with those properties and other experiences. Okay, yeah. so the claim was that uh, the brain actually uh, is a myth if we think about like a color injury in blind people has a, like a creation of their own mind. But at the same time, we could say that there are other properties that they perceive uh, and they are visual properties actually. Well, there are visual properties. For example, shape. Yeah. I don't know whether sh for us, shape is, a is a mostly a visual property. But shape is not necessarily a visual property. If I touch around the shaped object, I have an experience of, let's say, a sphere, a sphere yeah. or a circle. And even if uh, I'm not sighted, I have an experience of roundness. And so I would say that the, those properties, shapes, are not necessarily visual. Yeah. They are predominantly visual for sighted people, but uh, they're not necessarily just uh, uh, visual. Yeah, I agree. I'm not understanding why this is like a, a strong objection to the fact that the brain is a myth. I'm not really understanding the correlation because the tactile perception is like, in, as far as we know, is a... No, no. The myth, the myth is only that the brain produces the content of our perception inside. The myth is only the, the metric scenario, so to speak where a brain that has never had any contact with the external world but has only been connected with the device is able to produce internally the world of our phenomenal experience. As far as we know, in order to have a visual experience, we need eyes. In order to have tactile experiences, we need touch. In order to have a, um, auditory experience, we need ears and so forth. Even virtual reality is built by adding those physical phenomena in proximity of our uh, body. We, my point is that uh, we have no evidence that the brain is able to produce autonomously, uh, congenitally, a content, a phenomenal content. It seems to me that the, the overwhelming evidence shows that uh, in order to have an experience of uh, physical properties, we need to be in contact with that physical properties in the external world. And anyway, uh, yeah. I, I will get uh, more to that. Even Descartes himself, I was saying, uh, when he speaks about dreams, he says, well, after all, the mind is unable to produce by itself a content. It's like a painter. The mind is like a painter that in order to make a science or a satire, brings together pieces of the external world. So it's not able to produce something truly uh, new. And uh, so the idea that the brain in Avat, the congenitally brain in Avat, is able to produce uh, phenomenal experiences, so far has no convincing evidence. Has no uh, evidence of any kind. I mean, there are no brains in Avat from, from birth. So how do we know that they would be able to produce the phenomenal world that we are familiar with. We assume that they must be able to do so. But do we know that for sure? No, we don't. We have no evidence about that. But, uh, but um, I think it's a little bit different. I mean, I, I don't think that anyone believes that a brain about can be conscious. We, like saying that consciousness is within the brain doesn't mean that we don't need an external world in order to have consciousness. It's a different statement. So what you said in this second part, is that it's necessary to have an external world in order to have consciousness, and I think we all can agree on that. 
But I hope it is. Okay, but if consciousness was were a property of the neural activity in the brain, like uh, mass, like uh, charge, like electricity, like everything else, all the other properties of this object. If I were able to produce an identically uh, working uh, brain by other means, should the identically working brain not uh, having the, exactly the same uh, consciousness, if consciousness were a property of the brain? Uh, to my knowledge, I mean, uh, to have something similar of, of the example, like the solution of the brain in the past problem is that you would need a body in order to have... Like, a what? Uh, because, like, in order to be built, the brain needs connections. With is it, okay, okay, but is it just a practical concern that in order to build a brain so far we need also a body? Like, in order to make an egg, we need a chicken? Is that the kind of relation between the two problems? Or it is a stronger claim that Massimini and Tononi and the other people make, namely that the property, that the phenomenon that we call consciousness is a property of the brain? Because we could agree that so far, in order to make an egg, I need a chicken. And no one is able to make an egg. <laughs> There's no bio lab today that is able to make an egg without a chicken. So, in order to have an egg, we need a body. But that claim uh, is different. Because if I were able to build a, a, uh, an egg, uh, that egg would have all of the properties the yolk, uh, the protein, the, the fat, and whatever, of a real egg. Likewise, if I claim, as Tononi and Koch, and uh, that uh, consciousness is a property of the brain, no matter how I produce a brain, working in a certain way, way, but if I did, that brain should have that property that we call consciousness, just like it would have all of the other properties, because otherwise it's magic. Because then I would have two identical objects, and one would have Consciousness, because it had been in contact with the world and the body, and the other one, which is identical, would not have anything like that. And that, uh, for me, it's like uh, appealing to magic. So I think that one has to commit to the fact that if consciousness is a property of the brain, if I have two identical brains, they should have identical consciousness. Otherwise, it's magic. How could two identical objects have different properties? I think that that goes against uh, uh, physics. Okay. In fact, uh, please. No, I mean, uh, I think that in order to have some structure in that brain, I don't know, you need the brain to be exposed to the light, for example. Right. So you need a light in order to have brain, uh, like a regular brain, and the light is outside. So, I don't know, I don't see the problem here, but... Uh, okay, maybe, maybe, okay. Let, let me go ahead and get to the end of it. So, the idea is that uh, dreams are like that. The recombination of the external world. But uh, how could they work? So consider, for example, this case. Someone is looking through a half mirror, two objects. The first object, and because of them, one is able to see something that apparently does not exist in the real world. Why? Because it is a combination of two apparently separate objects. And why one uh, has this experience because because of the half mirror one is just uh, merging together one is just uh, uh, composing together two different objects uh, because lights follow uh, unusual pathways so usually we look at the object and we, there is just uh, a rectilinear segment I need to rush because I want to get to the end before Four, but okay, but occasionally the path may be unusual, and therefore we may put together a uh, different object. Like here, this is more fun to, to watch at. So we have this actor who, is, who has become poor and he watches at himself in the uh, screen, and he sees himself wearing a nice tuxedo. So he's just putting together the world. This is not a hallucination, but I think that this is a good idea about how hallucination may work. Can we have a better example? Yes, for example, you can take uh, artworks like uh, Bernard Pratt's portrait of uh, Salvador Dali, which is just a combination of uh, objects that are perceived in an unusual combination. Or uh, you can see this, for example, this is uh, uh, 
someone strangely resembling the goal, but he's not the goal, it's another character. And you may see that this artist is able to recombine the external world in such a way that you may actually see everything. So, this for me is a model of uh, this question. Okay, very quickly. What you say is uh, apparently right. But it may be days, and that's the third, the third step, and then we're getting five minutes and <laughs> let you go. Take your phone call after, <laughs> I know that. Uh, but what you just said is based on uh, a philosopher like Alfred North Whitehead would have called it the fallacy of simple temporal location. What do I mean? I mean that you say that uh, this recombination takes place afterwards when the original objects are no longer. Okay, uh, when the original objects are no longer. This is the key point. What do we mean for being no longer? What do we mean that when we are in a room, an object is no longer there? Well, of course, at that time, let's say at uh, 23, at 11 p.m. in that room, the apple is no longer there. But is the apple still that I saw? Let's suppose that I dream of an apple. Is the apple that I'm dreaming of not present in that room. The fact is that, that the apple that I saw, maybe one day before, or one year before, or 20 years before, is still producing an effect. So, usually we say that that is different from perception. But for a moment, let's reconsider perception. When I perceive something, is my neural activity taking place at the same time as the external object? No, we know that it's taking place later. How much later? Well, sometime later because of the uh, time that light takes to go from the external object to my eyes. But it also takes some time for the neural signal to go from for the opsin in the eye, from the neural signal to go from the eye to the cortex and so forth. So, for a moment, I'm just trying to reply to, to your question. For a moment, let's get back to the apple. Right now, is there a temporal delay, a temporal distance between the apple in my hand and the neural activity that leads to your conscious experience? Yes, between 100 and uh, 300 milliseconds. Let's suppose that right now this apple is getting farther and farther away. How much? A lot. 2,000, no, 280,000 kilometers. Now the apple is at the distance of the moon. And just for the sake of the example, has become large, <laughs> like the moon. So we watch the moon. The moon is one second and a half, between one second and one second and a half, far from us, from the neural activity in the brain. When do we, when we watch the moon? Do we see the moon or do we see a memory of the moon, an image of the moon? We perceive the moon just like we perceive the apple. And what if it was even farther away? Like the sun. Now it's eight minutes away, far away. Do we see the sun? Is the sun not in our present when we walk on the walls of Luca and we uh, sit in under the sunlight? Yes, that sun is still under our experience. And why is it so? Because basically present is not. And this is to reply to your question. So you see, your question was very much. This present is not like that. It's not made of the things that are taking place at a certain time. The present is made by all those things that are having an effect at a certain point in time. That are, to get back to the first point, that are relative to this object. We are getting close to the end. We are talking about time. So. So, the idea is that the present is not made of things that are synchronous with what's going on right now in the brain. The present is made by all those events that took place and that are still having an effect right now. This notion of the present comes from physics. 
Actually, it comes from. If I can. Oops. Don't know why. Oh. Okay. Comes from physics. Comes from uh, Einstein. In his famous analysis of simultaneity, he said that the present is not made by things that are taking place at the same time. It is made by things that are simultaneous. By simultaneous, he meant things that have an effect at the same moment. So the idea is that the present, therefore, is not made by the things that are taking place uh, right now, but it is made by everything that is having an effect right now. Because of the structure of my brain, when I go to a dark room, I go to sensory deprivation, or uh, I take drugs, or whatever, basically, my present is no longer made of the events that are close to my body in time and space, but the present is made by those, but all those events that in my life have been, are still producing an effect on my brain. So, what is the role of uh, the brain in this picture? The role of the brain is to be a causal frame of reference relative to which a world of relative objects spread in space and time are still having an effect right now. And that's actually what consciousness is. Consciousness is the fact that right now a world of objects that are able, because of my body, to produce an effect right now is having an effect right now. I'm talking with you and all my life, all my world is able, because of my body, to produce effects in this room. Things that happened to me 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, yesterday, can be part of this talk of mine, can have a causal effect. And because of that, they are able, like Adam, to bring into existence, like the brain is able to bring into existence a whole life. Let's skip stars and let's get, really get into the end. So, the idea of this hypothesis is that we are one with the world when we perceive and when we sleep or we have hallucination, so you see the world is spread at different uh, scales, both in time and space, no problem, it's all physical. But when we dream and we get to sleep, it is all our previous life that is still causally impinging on our body. And events that took place 10 days ago, 20 years ago, uh, one month ago, one year ago, and so forth, are still having an effect. And I am still perceiving them, because in a causal terms, I'm still one with them. Really the end of it. So, two references, one to Freud and one to Nietzsche. One to Freud. Freud said, well, we want it to be special. Gordon and uh, Darwin uh, gave the first blow to our Nazis because he said we are not, Copernicus gave the first blow because he said we are not in a special place in the universe and Darwin said we are not a special animal in the universe and this theory suggests that we are not even special because of our mind it suggests that we are just objects between objects that's it we are not conscious objects we don't have integrated information we are not addressing a special property that somehow only brains are able to bring into existence. We are just one with the world we are having an experience of. The second point I like to mention is the notion of uh, cause in itself by Nietzsche. The belief, once again here we are talking about uh, um, um, the extravagant pride of man, of man. You see the connection with the narcissism in Freud. Once again, the belief that we have to be a cause in ourselves that we have to be a kind of causal nexus, autonomous in the middle of everything. So, just to get to the end of it, I will skip this and we will just get to the end of it. And then maybe. I think there are, by and large, three possibilities. The first possibility to believe in some kind of dualism, like David Chalmers, like Koch. Koch admitted, I'm a neuroscientist, but in the end, I am supporting some kind of uh, romantic uh, dualism. So we assume that somehow the mind is something different from the physical world. Why? 
because we don't find anything like the mind where we look at, where we look for it. So it must be phenomenal. Second option, neuroscience, is the brain who does the work of the soul. But once again, we need to find inside this object some properties. And so far, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone finding anything like that. Third possibility. We are not here. We are here. In order to make this hypothesis work, we need to take into consideration the, the two steps, basically. First, the object is relative, which is consistent with physics. Second, everything takes place in space and time, which is consistent with physics, too. I've been skipping a little bit on the last point because of time limitations, but once we take this object in space and time as uh, something, uh, it may actually be the stuff my conscious experience is made of. So it's a conceptual shift in our, uh, uh, it's a big conceptual shift. So we are no longer inside the body, but we are one with the world. And the role of the body is no longer that of containing us. The role of the body is that of giving to a world a possibility to be causally relevant, to be able to do things. Because of me, because of my body, not because of me, because of my body, today this apple did, has done a lot of work in this room has been extremely active, this apple. And likewise, I think that that's what consciousness is, might be just the way in which our body brings into, bring into existence a world. So that's the idea. I know it's very strange and uh, that's it.